evening you've read a very strange and very beautiful work. When Gogol read parts of Dead Souls to Pushkin, Pushkin is reported to have exclaimed, my God, how sad our Russia is. <laughs> to which Gogol commented, even though I kept maintaining that I made it all up. And he did. It is a fiction. He called it a poema, P-O-E-M-A. And that's the Russian word for epic poem. They use that word for the epic. And it is a kind of epic, indeed. So both remarks are valid. Gogol invented the whole thing. As he said, he made it up. And though it does not represent the actuality of Russia, it does indeed show how sad Russia is, as well as how sad in general humankind is because we begin to catch on as we read it that it's not just about Russia. Gogol is not, of course, giving us a realistic picture of life in Russia during his time, like Aristophanes, like Cervantes, like Rabelais, Moliere, Flannery O'Connor. He's making a work of art, but it's a strange and weird work of art that is slanted so that it's not realistic. But he's giving us what any work of art is, which is a creative response to a communally shared life. Now, a real work of art is never just a picture of life as it is lived in a community, but it's a response to that life. And so Gogol's response is a skew and a jar. It's not straightforward. It's full of irony and strange suggestions. Now, Gogol, in one of his literary critical essays, speaks of the minor epic genre. He says, in modern times, there has emerged a type of narrative work that constitutes a sort of middle ground between the novel and the epic. See, what he's really trying to do is to adjust the novel to the epic. And it turns out to be comic and weird and strange. And yet, I think we can see as we study it more and more and as we think about it more and more, I think we can see the kind of truth that it gives us. The hero, he says, of this small epic is a private and insignificant figure, but one who is nonetheless significant to me in many respects for the observer of the human soul. The author leads his life through a chain of adventures and changes in order to present, along with a hero, a true-to-life picture of that which is significant in the society that he's writing about. Now, if you have this textbook, and I think you're fortunate if you do, because it's a very well-edited textbook. There may not have been enough to go around, but it has some of Gogol's letters, some of his comments. It has some good critical pieces about Gogol. And so um, perhaps we'll put, I have an extra copy, so perhaps I'll put it uh, on reserve or put some of it on uh, Blackboard for you to read, because I think you'll find it uh, very helpful indeed. He says, I had a premonition that all the lyrical digressions in the poem would be taken in a false sense, and they were. There were criticisms of the lyrical digressions because they don't seem to fit in with the satire of the piece. And Gogol goes on to say they're so vague, they're so little in accord with the objects passing before the eyes of the reader so irrelevant in the form and manner of the work as a whole that they lead both adversaries and defenders astray. And so he apologizes for having put in those beautiful lyrical passages where he says, talks about Russia and the songs of Russia and the sounds of Russia and the difference between 
a stout man and a thin man, and all those digressions about the pretty girl, the sparkling joy, that seem to interrupt the narrative. And he's made to feel ashamed of them because critics in his day uh, took them amiss. He speaks of the narrator's sensibility and of his reaction to the sad songs of Russia, which was taken as boasting. He speaks of those songs which rush across all of boundless Russia. And you may remember reading that passage in, in the novel. These songs eat into my heart, he says, and I marvel that everyone is not aware of the same thing. Almost 150 years have elapsed since our sovereign Peter I cleared our eyes by the purgatory of European enlightenment. So he calls that westernization process a purgatory of European enlightenment. Peter put in our hands all the means and instruments of action, and our spaces remain just as empty just as sorrowful and unpeopled, just as homeless and unfriendly as though we still have no home, no roof of our own, but somewhere pause on a public road and breathe from Russia, not the hearty natal air, which welcomes brothers, but a kind of cold chill at a post where only a guard indifferent to everything is stalely responding, no horses. So you see the peculiar kind of Gogolian humor there because he takes us on a kind of lyrical jaunt and then has this guard standing there indifferently saying, no horses, and he means no horses allowed. So that's a kind of um, taste of this strange flavor that we have in Dead Souls. Now Gogol's influence has been enormous in our day, we become familiar with his kind of comic wit in Monty Python and in Flannery O'Connor and Samuel Beckett, the theater of the absurd, painters like Marc Chagall, the magical realism of the Latin American writers. But in the 19th century, it was Dostoevsky who was most influenced by Gogol. So I would go so far as to say Dostoevsky could not have produced those mammoth novels that he wrote, those masterpieces that he wrote, without Gogol's having first opened up this strange vista. And so it's our job tonight to try to see what is that vista. It's not just comic. It's not just satiric. You know, it's not just sad. What is it? Outside of Russia, Gogol has had widespread fame only in the latter half of the 20th century. When I first started teaching the Russian novel course back in 1953, only two books in English on Gogol existed, and one of them treated him just as a satirist, just as a straightforward satirist. The other one was by Nabokov, that famous Russian writer, and it's a classic. I would recommend that if you want to read something good on Gogol, you read Nabokov's book on Gogol. Because Nabokov saw Gogol not as a satirist, but as a writer of the absurd, as a writer of what he called Poshlost, P-O-S-H-L-O-S-T. And that word is important to Gogol because it means something like tacky. It means something like what the German word kitsch means, if you know that word, K-I-T-S-C-H. Now kitsch and poshlost don't just apply to bad art. They apply to the pretentious, that which pretends to be good art. So the kinds of things that we would say are, ha, are, have a poshlost quality to them are those things that attempt the sublime and don't quite achieve it, 
those things that we call chromos in paintings, bad poems, trashy, gym crack. You're aware of all of those things, I think. TV shows that pretend, TV shows that pretend to be uh, very noble and beautiful as opposed to just ordinary, cheap, ordinary TV, which is all right. You see, things that know they're not very good are all right, but it's those that pretend to be something more than they are uh, that are full of pashlos. And so if we don't get anything else from Gogol, I think we ought to look back at dead souls and see uh, the way in which this pretentiousness, this bad taste has taken over Russia. Faulkner calls it Snopesism, and it is more than just bad taste. It's the flat, mean state of mind in which all that's petty and tawdry can flourish best. It's pretentious, it's false, vulgar, tacky, much worse than the obviously cheap and bad. It's the middle brow. It's soap operas and self-help books. It's romantic <laughs> novels. It's that painter, I've forgotten his name, uh, that's focused as the painter of light. Thomas, mm -hmm. he's, the <laughs> he's the absolute epitome of Pashlo. <laughs> it's Pavarotti, I'm sorry to say, you won't like that. It's those three tenors. <laughs> it's the Da Vinci Code, which is a badly written book. You know? <laughs> it's most current religious lyrics. It's chromos as paintings. It's blue bonnet paintings. All of those things that uh, attempt to be so spiritual and lovely and really just miss the mark. It's the dry rot of unreality that invades a society and takes over and destroys it. Now what Gogol would have us see is that there's something demonic behind this. And Faulkner later on in the 20th century would make us see that too. That Snopesism is motivated by the devil because its utter falsity stems from debasing everyone's sense of reality. True manners become sham. A true sense of elegance and beauty becomes sentimentality. Style becomes silly affectation with people imitating each other. So one of the, one of the chief examples we could see of it now is the tendency on television uh, to have constant streams of notorious people and what they're wearing you know what is what is she wearing this time and and uh, people eat that up and it really debases them without their knowing it you know not because it's immoral but simply because we're being given something false you know and in the pretense that it's something true Delicacy and subtlety in language is warped into ridiculous pretentiousness. There are degrees and codes. There are in-groups. And the virtues are entirely irrelevant. So the concept of trends, political correctness, talk shows, a great deal of TV evangelism, most curricula in schools, Slogans and causes and catchwords and phrases. Phrases like senseless crime, as though some crime is sensible. You know? <laughs> and using the word unacceptable, you know, instead of bad and inappropriate. I'm bringing it all up into our day to make you see that Pashlost is alive and well in our time. Now, actually, what Gogol would make us see is that evil is the very heart of Pashlos. It's the devil's work. So that all through this book, 
when he's saying the devil knows what it is, you know, we have to take that seriously. Because as many theologians would tell us, and as many great writers have shown us, it's the work of the devil to imitate the good. And when people take imitations of the good in society, for the good itself, then that society begins going downhill. Hannah Arendt spoke of the banality of evil, the tawdriness in everything that a society does. Gogol would make us see, I think, that that's the work of the devil. Because the quest for reality is the true journey in life. What we ought to be seeking constantly is the real. And I think this book would make us see that we're all on the road. We're all Russians in this book. Now, Dead Souls gives us a surrealism of language. It gives us non sequiturs and digressions. It calls peculiar and startling things the usual. It's always saying, God knows or the devil only can tell. So we're very much aware of the cosmos that we're in in this book. God knows and the devil knows. And so we have a wide spread if we take Gogol's writing seriously. And I think we are meant to. But our puzzlement is how to classify him how to think of him, how to interpret his work so that we see what he's getting at. Think about the apparent irrelevancies and the digressions that he gives us. The young man looking at Chichikov's carriage and then we never see him again. Think about the musing on the runaway serfs. And they don't even really exist in the novel. The lieutenant putting on his boots. The drunken peasant. Captain Kopakin, that story. How is that meant to fit in? Think about all of the author's comments. He talks about Russia. He talks about Russian class distinctions. He talks about Russian nicknames, the manners of ladies, the Russian language, the fast driving of Russians. He talks about mankind, the thin and the stout, the closeness of sad to gay, the ability of the middle class to eat well. He talks about the difference between a girl and a woman. And he's sad that society is going to turn a girl into a woman. Because that innocence and beauty of the girl with the egg-shaped head, the blonde, he knows will be trained out of her. And that she will learn to become trivial in her concerns the way women are in society. Think about what he says about the writer, the problem of characterization, the difficulty of the comic writer, and the fact that society doesn't take the comic writer seriously. So we're given so many different layers to concern ourselves with when we take this novel seriously. He gives us the elegant, low language that ordinary people use. And then the lofty lyric passages of comment by the author, digressions. He gives us the ignoble hero who's plump and round and mediocre and scheming and tricky. 
He gives us the pattern of a society's action, taking someone in, assimilating him in the community immediately, and then casting him out, like a pharmakos, like a vice. So he has so many of the patterns that we encounter in literature, and yet they're askew. They're not quite the same as we encounter in other works. Now let's look at the structure of the plot for a moment. There's the entry of Chechikov into the town of N. He makes a good impression. He calls on the officials. He visits Manilov. His carriage overturns. He visits Korobachka. He encounters Nozdriv and gets into a fight and thinks he's going to be killed. And as he does so many times, he thinks of his progeny, his children. What will happen to my children? He doesn't have any, and he's not married, but he's always afraid something bad is going to happen to his children. And then we have his visit to the miser, Plushkin, and the visit to the bear-like man, Sobakovich. And we meditate on all of these characters, and we think at first that some of them are pleasant. We're ready to think that Manilov is pleasant until we examine him a little closer. Look at him for a moment. He's too sweet. There's something cloying about him. He and his wife are always kissing each other and always offering each other a bite of something. Open your little mouth wide, dearest, and let me put this tidbit in it. Now that sounds sweet and lovely until you begin to think there's something wrong here. And, <laughs> and this is the way finally Chichikov has to look at this man who has a book that's always open on page 14, because he's always intending to read something profound, you know, but he doesn't get beyond page 14. And he's always hoping that someone will come along that he can have profound conversations with. He treats Chichikov as though he's an old friend and says, well, you finally come to see us. He just met him a few days ago, you know. And he tells his wife about him and acts as though he is a long lost friend. And so we begin to see that something is wrong. And we see the same thing with all of the people that he visits. Now Donald Fanger's book called The Creation of Nikolai Gogol seems to me to be the best study of Gogol's strange genius. He speaks of the mirroring motif within the work with Chichikov being like Stendhal's description of the novelist's role as that of a mirror going along a roadway. The mirror moving down the roadway is in the first place Chichikov himself, Fanger says, the featureless hero. Like a mirror, he's all surface. The portrait gallery of the book is a gallery of mirrors as well, Fanger says, only the author whose voice emerges distinctly from that of the narrator at times, remains above this process in the role of self-justifying commentator and ultimately creator. He comments that had the author not looked more deeply into Chichikov's soul, had he not stirred away from the bottom and from the light, had he not revealed the most secret thoughts that no man confesses to another, but rather shown him as he appeared to the whole town, readers would be happy with him and would take him for an interesting person. And that's true. When you think about Chichikov, if we met him, you know, at a party, we would think he was a very agreeable person. We would like him. 
because he has cultivated the art of getting along with people. But it's because the author shows us what he's like, you see, and tells us his secret thoughts, that then we begin to wonder what Gogol is doing with this kind of hero. Langer goes on to speak of the author's over role in the book. The authorial interpolations in Dead Souls, as opposed to narrative comments. See, there are narrative comments, but then there are authorial interpolations. And he says they're confessions and admonishments. They're pleas for sympathy and defiant complaints about probable misunderstanding. He's always thinking you're not going to appreciate the comic writer. The comic author has a difficult time, and he's always apologizing for it. But they remain outside the world of the novel, these, these comments, like the scattered fragments of an introduction which the author fears his readers might pass by. The world of that novel is the weed-like culture on the Russian heartland, conceived abstractly from a distance and bodied forth in disconcerting close-ups with absence commanding the same meticulous attention as the presence. So he says what the novel's about is that weed-like culture of the Russian heartland viewed from a distance with absence in it being given the same attention as presence. The theme of its broadest, he says, is the amorphousness, the characterlessness, the purposelessness, the senselessness, alternately ludicrous and ominous of life, specifically Russian life, as material for a novelist. Well, Chichikov ruminates after the ball, what if some writer decided to write about the whole scene as it is. Why, even there, even in a book, it would be just as senseless as it is in nature. What kind of scene is it? Moral? Immoral? The devil alone knows what. You just spit and then close the book. So he's always telling us that we wouldn't really appreciate uh, what the comic writer is going to tell us about human nature. You would just spit and close the book, he says. Now, Fanger calls to mind the necessity in interpreting Gogol as having some sort of polysemous scheme, such as Dante outlined in his letter. That is the literal, the allegorical, the tropological, and the anagogical. So Fanger considers Gogol to be writing allegory, a very complicated allegory that has a spiritual meaning as Dante's allegory. And so he thinks of it as a kind of version of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno of the Divine Comedy. But there was discernible to me at the time that I first encountered Gogol and there still is something even more than the comic, something even more than the absurd and the fantastic and then supreme verbal wit, something more than the slanted and weird exposure of human foibles, though they are here. It's certainly just to speak of dead souls as allegory and to view Gogol in the tradition of Dante. But, as I say, there's a feeling that there's something more here that is a different kind of approach from any, sorry, any that Fanger mentions. There's something that Aristophanes got at in Greek times there's the truly comic that is explored 
And so I think we have to go on and find some other words for what Gogol is doing because it's going to recur in Dostoevsky. And it's going to be this quality that makes people misunderstand Dostoevsky. And they think he's writing tragedy and just can't quite make it, you see, because there's this strange mixture of the comic and something else that I'm going to call the grotesque. I'm sorry about this rule. Excuse me. Now, the grotesque grew up in the Middle Ages. It was, and it was first, the word was first used in Renaissance Italy for the art of the grotto, unearthed in the banks of Titus and in Nero's house of gold. In its most limited sense, as Wilson Yates has pointed out in his introduction to a book called The Grotesque in Art and Literature, this man's name is Y-A-T-E-S, and the title of the book is The Grotesque in Art and Literature. He says the grotesque refers to a type of decorative art combining human features with fantastic beasts and birds in a filigree of curled vines and fruits taken up first by visual artists it consisted of the distortion of forms uncanny fawns heads peered around leaves strange ornamentations covered over parts of the human face a style developed in ancient rome and imitated by renaissance artists like raphael and pentericchio now these artists suggested something insouciant and fantastic as well as something sinister and ominous in the face of a world totally different from the familiar one. Now I think as soon as we step into Gogol's world, we realize we're in a world that is different from the familiar world that we're used to. Now the style moved from Italy to Germany where the major poets in the 18th and 19th centuries took their turns exploring its significance. Over the years, such words as bizarre and weird and fantastic and macabre and gothic and arabesque have been connected with the grotesque. And that grew up in the 19th century in Germany. And much ink has been spilt in attempting to distinguish these modes from each other. And yet, as Anthony DiRenzo points out in his study, American Gargoyles, Flannery O'Connor, and the Medieval Grotesque. Now, this man's name is D-I-R-E-N-Z-O, in case you want to read him sometime. And his book is American Gargoyles, Flannery O'Connor, and the Medieval Grotesque. And he says such grotesqueness was certainly present, not simply in pagan Rome, but in the Christian Middle Ages. And we have Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux writing about it when he says, what are these ridiculous monstrosities doing in the very cloisters where the monks do their reading? These strange things, hideously beautiful and beautifully hideous. What's the meaning of these filthy monkeys? these fierce lions and fearful centaurs. And he goes on, and then you think of the gargoyles on the cathedrals, so that we're very much aware that the Christian art style of the Middle Ages was <coughs> grotesque. But what exactly is the grotesque? And what is it about? What does it tell us? You may want to read a critic named Bakhtin, B-A-K-H-T-I-N, because he delineates one of the major strains of the grotesque as the carnivalistic celebration of the Christian folk. Now you will see some signs of that carnivalistic uh, in Gogol, but you'll really see it when we get to Dostoevsky, for whom the distorted represented part of the authentic apprehension of reality. Now you might think about for just a moment um, what we saw in the 
the devastation of New Orleans. You see, it was a kind of grotesque because that city is old, that city is unique. That city is like a transplanted part of the Middle Ages uh, in America. And when it was eviscerated, so to say, and we saw all the strange things about it, the nation as a whole was shocked because it was grotesque in the way that Gogol is grotesque. It didn't fit any particular classical pattern that we're used to seeing. So I think you want to think a great deal about uh, the, what the grotesque vision is and get more or less used to it because certainly Dostoevsky is going to give you tragic material, but he's going to tilt it slightly so that its total effect is grotesque. Now, what does the grotesque mean? You know, does it have any particular meaning? There are two approaches to it. There's the Christian approach to it, and then there's the secular approach. The Christian approach to the grotesque sees it as the representation of evil. What evil does in this world to the good. The secular grotesque sees it simply as the representation of an estranged world. And it makes the familiar suddenly seem distorted, as in a photograph where the colors are slightly off register and the familiar looks strange. Forms are deranged. The hidden intrudes itself. To recognize and reveal such a construct of opposites, Kaiser, Wolfgang Kaiser, who's written a book on it, says it's somewhat diabolical. The order is destroyed and an abyss is opened where we thought to stand on firm ground. It's like a color photograph that just fails to register. So if you read Gogol just straightforwardly, thinking you were getting a straightforward satire, see, because that's what we first think about him, is that he's satirizing Russia and its pretensions and is trying to be modern and up-to-date and European. There's more to it than that. And if you go back and look at some of the passages and how strange they are and how weird they are and how beautiful some of them are. Think of the miser Plushkin. And all of that is not just a sat satire. See, there's something really strange and demonic in it. And his piles of junk that he's accumulated and his, his wild garden and yet the wild garden has a beauty to it. Nature has taken over part of it. So we have to, I think with Gogol, we have to read carefully and closely to see uh, what he's doing with all of his descriptions, because they are not mere descriptions. Now Flannery O'Connor, in our day, in her book, Mystery and Manners, says my own feeling is that writers who see by the light of their Christian faith will have in these times the sharpest eyes for the grotesque, for the perverse. The novelist with Christian concerns will find in modern life distortions which are repugnant to him, and his problem will be to make these appear as distortions to an audience which is used to seeing them as natural, you see. We see all the time the grotesque manifested to us and we take it simply as ordinary. And so we have to sharpen our vision and notice. And she continues and says that he well may be forced to take ever more violent means, the novel, the Christian novelist, to get his message across to this hostile audience. She says the problem 
for such a novelist will be to know how far he can distort without destroying. And in order not to destroy, he will have to descend far enough into himself to reach those underground springs that gave life to his work. And so the novelist who is a Christian, she thinks, will have to descend through the darkness of the familiar into a world where like the blind man cured in the Gospels, he sees men as if they were trees, but walking. She says, this is the beginning of vision. So I think we find something of that sort in Gogol. The elements of the grotesque then are confusion, a fantastic quality, and a kind of alienation from the world. The grotesque is the estranged world. But it remained for Victor Hugo to tell us what is the real essence of the grotesque. Because he went on to say, we don't recognize the grotesque in the absence of the sublime. So he says the true depth of the grotesque is revealed only in its confrontation with its opposite, the sublime. For just as the sublime guides our view toward a loftier supernatural world, the ridiculously distorted and monstrously horrible ingredients of the grotesque point to an inhuman, nocturnal, and abysmal realm. So Gogol's world is like a color photograph, we've said, that just fails to register. Something's ajar. He reveals a crack through which the weird and the strange may enter. Now, all of this is said simply to um, attest to the fact that it's not mere satire that we're reading. He's not simply making fun of these characters. He's revealing something profound and astonishing and unsettling. So the grotesque is the estranged world, our own world, suddenly transformed into the ominous. Now, it's not necessarily part of the comic. It's the inclusion in any of the, of the genres, lyric, tragedy, comedy, and epic, of the supernatural. Now, you see what, um, what I'm getting at is that the novel in Europe at this time had become totally naturalistic. There was no room for all of the presences that we had had in the great epics and in the divine comedy and in all the literature preceding modernity. All of that was cut away. And what we had was the purely natural now in the novel. So Gogol brings back into the novel. And I don't think Dostoevsky then could have produced the novels that he produced later. He said he couldn't have without Gogol's writing. So it's as though Gogol opened the door to the supernatural. Because as Flannery O'Connor says, when the supernatural enters into the world of the novelist, it has to do so as grotesque. And particularly in the modern world does it have to. So the grotesque extends the natural, the range of most artists, particularly in the novel, which arose in the world of fact. The grotesque is the intrusion of the alien and strange into concrete physical life. But the fullness of it consists, as Hugo says, in the combination of the sublime and the, the demonic with alternations between the two. And so I think you see that as the structure in Dead Souls. If, if I were the kind of teacher that used, as I ought to, uh, projector and could show you all the designs that I've drawn of this novel. You can't see that really, <laughs> but it would look something like that. 
because what you have here is Chichikov's journey into the town, and then you have all of the dimensions of reality upward and downward. Now let me explain what I mean. We have the city. He comes into the city. And on the positive side, on the side that belongs to the good, and ultimately it's God, you see, and he's constantly saying, God only knows, you see, and we think it's just a joke. But he has introduced God into this novel, and he's always saying, the devil no only knows. So we alternate in this novel between God and the devil, and this territory that he comes into, you see, has both elements in it. So the city, and in the city on the good side, we have the aristocratic society that is good manners, and yet we begin to see what we have is bureaucratic society, the orders of society that uh, order everybody around and that each pretends he's superior to the other. And then above that is the country life and various characters outside the city so that we think Manilov and Korobachka are Arcadian and romantic in the countryside, and yet we have the farm life. Then Korobachka is ignorant and suspicious and backward. And then in the outside world, larger than uh, Russia, or larger than this city, we have Chichikov's youth in the demonic realm, and we have Captain Kopakin in the upper realm. Here we have Holy Russia, and here we have Backward Russia, and here we have mankind, the poet, the passions, and mankind, selfishness, venality, and credulity. The lofty poet's vision that he's always talking about and the comic poet's vision that he's always talking about. So, what he has given us, and one is aware, I think, of this. It's not just that you uh, make it up and put it on it, but one is aware of this strange flavor of Gogol uh, from a first reading, that he's, he's bringing in a kind of wide canvas uh, to which he subjects, or on which he depicts, all of the things that he sees, and they seem realistic at first but they are not realistic. They are strangely altered. And so this is what we mean by the grotesque, is that wide veering from the pleasant and the beautiful and the good suddenly to the ominous, the evil, the selfish, the venal. And so what we have is the battle between Holy Russia, old Holy Russia, and the modern, new version of capitalism that came in from the West. And so you recognize that Chichikov was brought up to respect money. If you read his early life, his father taught him that you have to have money, you have to respect money, and he's doing the ultimate capitalistic buyout. You know, he's a raider. He's doing what so many of our very wealthy men in America have done. They, they buy things that are not anything, you know, so that their money is spent on abstractions, and yet they become wealthy. And so he is buying dead souls. Now why? Because there are taxes on dead souls, and proprietors would be glad to get them off their hands, off the list, so they wouldn't have to pay taxes on them. But even so, it sounds strange to them when he comes up with his scheme, and they have to wonder and to doubt, you know, as dumb as some of them are. Korobachka is, su is superstitious and suspicious, and so she wants to know what's the going price for them. If you want to buy them, somebody else might want to buy them and I could get a better price for them somewhere else. And so uh, we see the characters exposed in this grotesque manner then, and the whole thing is the conflict between old holy Russia that the narrator sings about constantly in his lyric passages, 
and the realistic, debased Russia that has lost its sense of tradition, lost its contact with its own soul. And so at the end of this work, and I asked you to read only the first part, uh, at the end of this work, we have that song to, to Russia. You know, where are you going? You know, the other nations will have to step aside and let the Troika pass. The, the carriage with the three horses that goes so fast because Russia is something to be watched and we need to step aside and let her pass. So think about the grotesque because I think you'll see a great deal of it, not in the next novel you read. Now the next novel you read will be Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, which is modeled on the European novel. It's a beautifully put together novel. It's the kind of novel that we'd call the well-made novel. You're familiar with that style and it won't surprise you at all and it will be easy reading. But Gogol introduced something completely new and I think it has had a worldwide effect it, because, as I say, the Latin American novelists now, with their magical realism, are taking up Gogol and learning from him. So let's, let's think about the ridiculous and the sublime uh, more and the way in which we find these manifested in the work. Where would you say is any touch of old, holy Russia? Well, the first touch of it, it seems to me, is in that little girl's muddy feet. <laughs> the little girl that directs Chichikov. She's a little serf that belongs to Korobachka. And she rides with Chichikov, and she has a certainty about where you go. She tells him where to turn, and it looks as though she has on black boots because her legs are so muddy. And it seems to me that is a touch of old Russia, a touch of something genuine that is not fake, that's not banal. And then I think we find it in the glittering joy of the pretty girl because it makes even Chichikov fall to dreaming and it strikes something noble in his heart even. He who has been so badly brought up and who is after money and getting ahead in the world. And then we have, I think, Plushkin and the image of the drowning man going down for the last time. I think this is on page 132, if you have this edition. And he's telling us there that for a moment, Chichikov remembered a childhood friend, and there was a flicker of real emotion that passed over his face, and it was a terrible thing to see, because he went on to say it was like a drowning man going down for the last time. And you knew that there wouldn't be anything more human left in this miser because he has weeded everything out of himself that's human. He's collected junk, piles of junk. And you see that pile of junk that he has is grotesque. You know, all of that is grotesque. The daughter coming in, the moldy Easter cake that he has saved, the bugs that he gets out of the little liqueur glass before you're supposed to drink out of it, all of that, because he saves everything. The one pair of boots that the serfs have to put on when they come in the hall, you see? And he's a rich man. So this portrait of the miser is terrifying indeed, and Chichikov is affected by it. Chichikov is also affected by the names of the dead serfs. The reality, the presence of the dead serfs. 
he has to ponder them and go over their strange names and think about them. And there is another touch of old holy Russia in these very concrete dead serfs that we hear about. One of them called No Respect for the Pig Trough. And another one that burned up. He burned up because he drank too much brandy and just a little flame started coming out of him. And he just burned up. So all of them have a concreteness and a reality to them that touches Chichikov and begins some kind of transformation in him. And then we get on down to our narrator talking about the passions and telling us that there is a passion perhaps in Chichikov that he's unaware of. He's been brought up to be practical and to look out for himself. And yet there may be something in him that is beginning to stir that will change him. So when you put together the wonderful, rollicking comedy of these characters that he visits, Korobachka won't feed him any meat, but gives him all baked goods when she finds out he might be buying something. And so she'd better cultivate him. And so he eats pancakes, rolls them up three at a time with butter, and enjoys all the baked goods that she gives him. But she's stingy, you can tell. And she's suspicious. And it is Korobachka that causes the downfall of our hero. So while we are studying this novel, we need to keep in mind the following questions. All right, what is the mode of dead souls? Is it satiric or realistic, allegorical, ironic, or as I'm suggesting, grotesque? And second, what are we supposed to think of Chichikov? Is he diabolical? Or is he simply the comic rascal that the Greeks call the poneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S, and that Aristophanes writes about? Is there any real viciousness in Chichikov? What is the peripety of the novel? And that's the turning point, the peripeteia. When the action begins going in a different direction, what defeats Chichikov? How does the novel end? Now we're speaking of part one, for it's complete in itself. Part two is not considered to be a finished work, and we'll talk about that after the break. We'll talk about Gogol's life after the break. And then look for the indications of westernization in the world that Chichikov invades. Are there any traces of the old, earthy, holy Russia? And I was just discussing that with you, that it's to be found in odd places. And the narrator finds it in the vast steppe <coughs> and the music of Russia, the songs of Russia. And then number five, note Gogol's supreme concreteness. He's extremely concrete and specific. The weirdness of his characters and his landscapes are not in the least like those of Edgar Allan Poe. So you might think that Gogol is like Poe, but Poe surrounds his scenes with a blurred vision. <laughs> 
and he tells you it was a deep, dark, horrifying night. He just tells you those things, you see. When I came to the melancholy house of Usher. So Poe is at the opposite pole from Gogol because Gogol is giving you concrete, real things that you think you've seen before, and then all of a sudden they become strange as you look at them. And so the mark of Gogol is very sharp imagery. How does he manage to make his specific details take on a grotesque distortion? Then characterize the persons that Chichikov visits. Are they simply types? If so, of what? And does Chichikov change in the course of the novel? Or does he end staring out at that funeral and falling into that kind of dreamy state that he falls into whenever he's uh, just still and not going anywhere. Is he really thinking? Is he meditating? Has he learned anything? And then finally, who is the narrator? Is it Gogol? <laughs> or is it an assumed narrator? And what are some of the topics that the narrator engages? And what about the Troika section at the end? Is it serious or ironic? And all of those hymns to Russia that we find at the end, are they meant to be ironic? Or are they straightforward? Well, now let's think just a little bit more about the characters that he visits. Manilov. He seems like the Arcadian ideal of pastoral life. He seems to pursue wisdom. He lives for friendship and love. He praises everyone indiscriminately. But when you have been with him for very long, you begin to see that he's insipid, cloying, nauseatingly sweet. He's overly polite. He says, allow me not to allow it. He's sterile. His life points to nothing beyond itself. Smoking for him takes the place of food and of thought. You know, as long as he can just smoke, he thinks he's thinking, but he's not. And he plans all kinds of schemes to improve his property, but they never get done. He's neither one thing nor the other. He's in between. And the visit to his house gives us a terrible vision of what the world calls happiness. Because they have two little children, one that has to have his nose wiped, or else a drop of foreign matter would have fallen into his soup. <laughs> and he's a future ambassador. And when they ask him, what's the finest city in France? You know, he knows the answer. So they think he's a genius. So here is this married couple that seem happy with each other, like the Arcadian ideal. And yet it's all slightly ajar. So that as Chichikov thinks, you begin to think, what the devil is this? What's the matter with this? And then Korobachka, whose name means little box. She's the ignorant life on the land. The peasants' virtues have disappeared. She's selfish and greedy and superstitious and suspicious and backward and stingy. 
she's wild and irrational. And she doesn't trust anyone. And then Sabakovich, who steps on your feet and apologizes, looks like a good solid citizen. But where Manilov praises everybody, Sobakovich runs everybody down. The same people that Manilov said are perfectly delightful, Sobakovich thinks are dreadful. So he's basically malicious. He's a glutton. His common sense has degenerated to slander and detraction of others. So all of these characters seem like versions of standard good citizens that we ought to uh, respect. And Nasdrib seems like that fine fellow that's always happy, glad to see you, cheerful. And then we see the underside of Nasdrib. You know, that he's really violent and vicious. That he constantly wants to make a bet on something. That underneath everything he says is a tone of, uh, of possible ill will and brutal behavior. He cheats. He's insulting. He bargains. He's dissipated. He's brutal. And we can look at the food at each of their houses to tell something about them. The food is carelessly prepared at his house, but there's an excess of liquors. There's all kinds of liquors. And then we've spoken about Plushkin and how terrifying the vision is of him. Now, none is in the right order. All are distorted and grotesque. The Russian idea still hovers over the action, giving the forms some coherence. But the dry rot of Pashlost, see, Pashlost is that nothingness that invades a society that is beginning to go downhill. Pashlost has distorted <laughs> everything and drained it of life. The diabolical can enter the old order when the love of gain takes the place of the old verity. So what Gogol has given us then is a picture of Russia that is incipiently tragic. And so those hymns to Russia at the end, the passages about the songs of Russia and the way they touch the narrator's heart all of that is old, holy Russia, invaded then by a westernization process that is alien to it. In the West, there was a gradual acceptance of this change, but it came into Russia with a suddenness that made it extremely destructive. Well, why don't you take a break now, and after the break, I want to talk about a short story of Gogol called The Nose, and I want us to read some passages, and I want to look a little bit at Gogol's life. So take 15 minutes. Let me say just a word or two about the method of reading that I'm advocating. It may seem that when I ask you picky little questions such as I did on that quiz, uh, that I wasn't serious about your reading rapidly, but but I am. Uh, it's just a grotesque theory of reading. <laughs> <laughs> now, in order to get beyond the blocking self, you see, most of the time when we read, we read as a projection almost of our own rationality and our own mind blocks some of the meaning, the deeper meaning, that 
reality can have. And so our own exalted rationality gets in the way. And so we have to have what Keats called negative capability. You know, this ability, as he said, to be in the presence of mysteries without asking any question, just to be there and take it all in as though we were having an experience, a real experience. So we have to yield to the novel so that we can move through it quickly and yet alert and aware. Now we don't read critically, so we don't put up any obstacle. But as Coleridge has written, we carry the reason along on loose reins. In other words, reason doesn't dominate, it just kind of comes along with us as we're reading. Now you listen to a symphony this way, and you watch even a very serious film in this way. And some of you are very, very adept at watching films and catching, you know, details and images and can call them back, you know, and we learn that skill. You know, some people just sort of gloss over it and, and aren't alert enough to a film. So the kind of reading that I'm advocating that you do in this course is that alert kind of yielding to the work at its pace. You know, because literature is partly a temporal art. It's not a spatial art except when we stop it and analyze certain scenes and, port and images. So we develop our empathy, and this is a positive development. It's not a compromise. It's not that you say, I've got to read this rapidly because I've got to finish this book. You see, but it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a positive uh, development that you uh, are able to come to. Narrative speaks to parts of the soul. The narratives go back as far as human beings existed that we know of at any rate. And, and that narrative story with the whole group going along with the narrative is, is profound. So narratives speak to parts of the soul, that part of us that recognizes immediately. Plato called it the noose, you see so that you don't reason toward something, you just recognize it. But it has to be developed in us because most of the time we live on a level of fact and rationality, lower reason. So to read these novels, we open to them, but we read with a pencil in our hands marking the passages that we think we should come back to when you have time for analysis. Now, I don't expect you to have time to do it before class. Uh, the little test that I give is just a test of your alertness in that rapid reading that you're doing. We go on with the pace that the author controls, seeking to have an experience you see, if we have an experience, we don't forget it because it becomes our own in the way that we, as I say, listen to a symphony or watch a film. If we have a deep enough impression, then we can examine it critically afterward. You could call up those of you that have studied the Iliad, you know, if I ask you to think about it and think about a certain scene that you can call it up in your mind and the whole thing is there and you can analyze it and look at certain parts of it you know without looking at the text the important thing that we should be attempting to learn is how to get something off the printed page you see and into our hearts or minds or souls so that we know these works. So to have an experience then is to be aware of the senses, not the critical faculty, 
but to be open, accepting, with empathy. We don't identify with a single character. Now, when we get to Dostoevsky, uh, you know, this is going to be important for you that you that you don't really identify with a certain character. You take in the whole thing, and you have empathy toward all the characters. It's the entire vision that we seek. Remember that Aristotle said characters are agents of the action. So we're trying to go with the action and to see what it is. Something is going on that the characters express. And that action cannot be grasped by the analytical reason. So you have to develop what Keats called negative capability, you know, of being present to things without seeking for answers, without seeking to dominate and to control. All right, let's talk a little bit about Gogol's life because he was a strange person and he had a strange life. When he died, Turgenev, whom you will read next time, and you won't have tr any trouble reading the Turgenev novel, as I say, because it's a very well-made novel. It's like a European novel. Turgenev spent a great deal of his time in Europe. But Turgenev said of Gogol, Gogol was more than a writer to us. He revealed us to ourselves. Perhaps my words written under the stress of grief will strike you as exaggerated. You would have to be a Russian to feel them. Even the most acute minds among the foreigners saw Gogol only as a humorist in the English manner. They failed to see his historic significance. I'm still quoting Turgenev. He says, I repeat, one has to be a Russian to realize what we have lost. But as the critic Magarshak, he's one of the most well-known of the Russian, of the critics of these Russian writers, M-A-G-A-R-S-H-A-C-K. He said it was not simply that Gogol revealed Russians to themselves, it was his extraordinary artistry, his style, his manner, that created a remarkable gallery of human types for all novelists, not just Russians. He says the extraordinary power of a creative artist to bring about <coughs> what amounted to a revolution in the minds of his countrymen becomes even more extraordinary when we consider that it was wielded by an entirely unknown man the son of an obscure and comparatively poor Ukrainian, a man whose social position was utterly insignificant. Now, my own view is that Gogol's imagination was that of an epic poet who created an entire cosmos. That was what I was trying to show you with those grotesque diagrams that I held up for you. He gives us an entire cosmos, such as the Greeks did, you know, with their Mount Olympus and their underworld, such as Dante did with his Inferno and his Paradiso, and such as we lost, you see, with the domination of the novel. Because the novel was born in an <coughs> age of fact, in an empirical age. And so it more and more began to be about simply social life with none of the other realms that the mind and the imagination have access to. So Gogol opened up a mythic kind of reality which other writers could use. The tension in his work is between a now distorted and decaying old holy Russia and the conniving greed of a new western 
system. Now, Gogol was born in 1809 in Ukraine, which became a part of Russia only a hundred years earlier. It had been a part of Poland before that. Contemporaries picture him always as a boy of poor and delicate health, always brooding and serious. He was called a mysterious dwarf by some of his companions. His mother spoiled him and always played a great part in his life, supplying him with folk tales and legends after he'd moved to St. Petersburg. And he was hungry for stories to write about, so he'd write home to his mother and tell her to send him some folk tales from the Ukraine. He'd gone on to Petersburg when he was 19, where because he was shy and ill at ease, he had adopted the pose of a dandy. And so the city seemed gloomy and ugly to him. And a book that some of you may want to read that I think is very fine, it's about Gogol and Dostoevsky, and it's by Donald Fanger, F-A-N-G-E-R. And it's called Romanticism and Realism. And it talks about the fantastic quality of St. Petersburg and the way in which it affected these Russian writers, that nothing seemed real to them in that city. Gogol published a long poem which got bad reviews. It was Byronic, it was modeled on poetry of Byron, and that depressed him a great deal, but then he was introduced to Pushkin, and we talked about Pushkin last time, who wrote The Bronze Horseman, and Pushkin thought he was, Gogol was talented, and so out of his loneliness and melancholy, Gogol began writing about his native Ukraine. The result was a book called Evenings on a Farm Near Dikonka, which opened the way for him into the highest literary circles. Pushkin sponsored him after this. Now these works that he wrote were folk comedy, they were anecdotes, and they had a supernatural spirit world in them, as fairy tales, folk tales frequently do. The theme in them was the intrusion of evil, irrational powers into plain everyday life. And the devil plays a large part in these early folk tales that Gogol wrote about, some of them apparently original with him. Now, one of his essays in this book was on the Middle Ages. He was quite a scholar of the Middle Ages, and so he was made professor of history at the University of Petersburg. But that had disastrous consequences because really he used up all he knew about the Middle Ages in his first lecture. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nightmare of some of us that are teachers. And so what he had to do, what he actually did was he pretended he had a toothache and he, he bound his head and jaw up and he would come to class, you know, with his head all tied up and couldn't talk. And so he did that for a while until they caught on and let him go. <laughs> so. So this gives you some idea of how, how weird uh, Gogol himself was. Now, he wrote Dead Souls then, after he had published other volumes. And one of the stories that I want to read you out of his earlier collection is called, I'm not going to read you the story, I'm going to analyze it for you, it's called, called The Nose. Now, last time, remember, we, I told you about the overcoat. Well, this time I'm going to tell you about the nose. A barber wakes up one morning, cuts into his morning loaf of bread, and finds something resistant and gristly in it. A nose. <laughs> now, that's the nightmare of barbers, you see. <laughs> because they're always afraid of cutting off somebody's nose. <laughs> and so he feels very guilty. And he wraps the nose in a rag and takes it with him out into the streets, hoping to find some way to dispose of it. <laughs> but everything conspires against him, and finally he's able to throw it over a bridge into the water. But a policeman comes up 
and seizes him and asks him what he's doing. And that part of the story breaks off just at that moment and we leave the barber there in the hands of the policeman. And we switch over to a government official of the civil rank. Now, you know, Peter the Great introduced civil service into Russia and there were so many degrees of civil service and each one looked down on the next one as you saw in Dead Souls. So a government official of the civil rank, equivalent to a major, one of the barber's customers, who prides himself on his nose, finds that his, wakes up one morning and finds that his nose has disappeared. He's ashamed to be seen. He hides his face and he goes about looking for the nose. Now, this is all something that Monty Python could do, you see, in our time. He encounters the nose, dressed in a fine outfit, <laughs> riding in a carriage, attempting to take over his identity. <laughs> and so the government official strikes up an acquaintance with the nose and attempts to let it know that he's aware of it and of who he is. The world is full of all sorts of absurdities, the story says. Sometimes there's not even a semblance of truth. Suddenly the very same nose, which had been driving about disguised as a state counselor and had created such an uproar in town, found itself as if nothing had happened on its accustomed place again, namely between the two cheeks of Major Kovalyov, we're told. So the nose gets back into its right place. And after all sorts of humiliation, the major makes up one morning and his nose is back on his face. He's overjoyed and he goes to his barber who shaves him with some timidity. And the story ends. So that's the sort of thing that happened in the northern capital of our far-flung empire. Only now, thinking it all over, we can see that there's a great deal that's improbable in it. <laughs> it's improper, awkward, not nice. It's like, no, I simply can't understand it. In the first place, it's of no benefit whatever to our country. And in the second place, but in the second place, there's no benefit whatever. I simply don't know what to make of it. All the same, on second thoughts, there really is something in it. Say what you like, but such things do happen. Not often, <laughs> but they do happen. <laughs> and so that's, that's one of his most famous short stories, along with the overcoat. Now, of course, it contains a satire on society, on the bureaucratic hierarchical degrees of society and on the vanity and pride of people. But it has so much more in it than simply satire. And so I think we need to remember the overcoat and the nose when we think about Gogol and his longer work, which is a more ambitious work and had a greater effect, which is what you read for this evening, Dead Souls. Now, after he published this volume, he published Dead Souls. And it was noticed by the critics. There was growing up in Russia at this time a group of critics who were leftists, as most critics still are <laughs> in our time. They were intellectuals. And so think of the courage that these writers had to have. Because on one hand, they were subject to the czar. And he was extremely conservative, of course. And he had henchmen that read everything that was published and had to approve it. And on the other hand was the critics. And if you didn't embrace a kind of social humanitarianism, uh, they criticized your work so harshly that you, it never did get read by people. So these men wrote in a time that was extremely dangerous because, of course, the czar could have you executed. And the critics could make sure that your works were never read. So to have a body of men such as this writing at a time like that is a remarkable thing. And so Gogol published Dead Souls, which caused quite a stir. And after this, he moved 
from place to place. And he lived mostly in Rome. And he began writing on the second part of Dead Souls. But he put it aside to write a direct moral message to the world. And that moral message was called Selected Passages from Correspondence with Friends. And it was extremely conservative, extremely right wing, as we would say. It was defending serfdom. It was defending the czar. Because Gogol was becoming more and more religious. And it seemed to him that the right thing for people to do was to accept the order that existed. Well, this scandalized his friends, of course. And uh, they were up in arms. And Belinsky, B-E-L-I-N-S-K-Y, who was the foremost critic, a very brilliant man, uh, wrote a reply to the letter. And a group of literary men met to read Belinsky's letter, his reply to Gogol. And that was when, and Dostoevsky was there, and that was when the Tsar's men broke in, arrested them all, and took them to the Tsar, who sentenced them to death. So Dostoevsky was sentenced to death. And they marched all of these men out in Red Square, put the bandages over their eyes. And about that time, the Tsar's horsemen came and told them that their sentence had been changed to uh, hard labor in Siberia. So Dostoevsky spent, this is jumping ahead to Dostoevsky, but I just wanted you to know what the conditions were that these men wrote under. Dostoevsky spent 10 years in Siberia then before he could come back and begin his writing again. And this was over a reply to Gogol's letter. So Gogol, Gogol was cruelly disappointed in the reception of his book. His best friends, the Slavophils, now they were divided just as we're divided into red and blue now, you know, uh, they were divided into the Slavophils, who were the conservatives, and the Westernizers, who were mostly leftists. Even the Slavophils, though, didn't approve of Gogol's book. So he became more and more depressed. He kept trying to write the second part of Dead Souls, but he burned several attempts. And the part that is published in your book, if you have this book, and if you can get hold of this book, I certainly recommend it to you because it has good literary criticism in it. But the part that's published in it is considered inferior, the second part. So I didn't have you read it because it seems to me it's not uh, really authentic. People pieced together, burned fragments, you know, after Gogol had decided that he didn't want to save the work. He died in Rome. His friends all lamented the fact that he had taken up with a Roman Catholic priest, deserting the Russian Orthodox Church. And so they wanted to think that everything he did was simply fanaticism here in the latter part of his life. One of the things that would be interesting for you to read in the Nabokov book is the account of Gogol's death. It's, he, he does a very fascinating job of reporting uh, on something that's quite gruesome. All right, now certainly we have in Dead Souls all the paradigms that I've mentioned. It, it's about partialist, it's grotesque, and yet certainly it is unique. It's not quite like anything else that we could name. Now let's look in our minds at the whole thing, not just Chichikov's story, but the story also of the narrator. The central action is that of the narrator's progression towards vision. See, we wonder 
whether Chichikov changes or not. And I'm not sure we can be certain one way or the other. But the narrator, we know very intimately from his comments all through the book. And so the central action is that of the narrator's progression toward vision. So the narrator, not Chichikov, is in search of Holy Russia, which is the symbol for the right order of mankind. You know, when we read these books, we are Russians. Just as when we read Greek tragedy, we're Greeks. So Chichikov, as the narrative tells us, is the acquisitive man, that is modern man. Neither too fat nor too thin, mediocre, lukewarm. You're going to encounter that word a great deal in Dostoevsky's writings. And when we think about Pashlust, that it is the sign of the mediocre. And it seems that the mediocre is not so sinister until we remember the biblical saying, God says, because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee from my mouth. So Dostoevsky will take up this theme also. He learned much from Gogol. So this novel is about mediocrity. It's about the lukewarm. It's about Pashlus. And we'll have to decide whether we think Chichikov is changed by what he encounters. But I'm maintaining that the narrator is. Chichikov is the modern day everyman. Not too fat, not too thin, not really vicious, only out for himself, as he's been taught to be. His father cautions him about the value of money and imbues in him the desire to succeed at any cost. And his teacher, you remember, wants him to behave and cooperate and not to disturb the classroom with original thoughts. The narrator is telling us that he can find the truth about the human situation only by harnessing a scoundrel. He can't find it any longer in the so-called virtuous men because virtue has been so falsified that we no longer have anything to learn from it or from what it's called virtue. So we'd better take an ordinary representative man, follow him about, and learn what we can from him. We'd better look at Russia through his eyes. And so we do. And we see Chichikov changing, though the change is occurring in him so unconsciously that he can't be aware of it. He can only close his eyes and fall into dreaming as he does whenever anything profound is likely to occur to him. Chichikov's deepening begins, as we said, with the little girl with muddy feet. It continues when he's almost beaten up, killed, almost, he fears. And then when he sees the radiant joy, and when he encounters Plushkin, we may assume that he understands at least to some degree from Plushkin the poverty of acquisition. He has a strange feeling about the dead serfs. He can't keep from thinking about them. Now the page numbers for these things I'm mentioning are, refer to this uh, Norton Critical Edition. The little girl with muddy feet is on page 68. The radiant joy of the little blonde girl, the governor's daughter she turns out to be is page 99. 
the 101. And his encounter with Pushkin begins on page 135. And his strange feeling about the dead serfs is on page 142. Now, after the town's turning against him and the death of the public prosecutor, he speaks of a day of judgment to Cellophane, his coachman. Now, hyperbolically, of course, but he's aware of some sort of reckoning that he can be held to. This is all Chichikov. This is not the narrator. Then enriching, I mean, no, watching the funeral procession, he goes into a somnolent state on page 230. And we leave him then after the procession has passed, beginning his journey on the road again and facing a boundless horizon with the past already behind him. Thus the narrator knows this is a creature worth bothering about, this Chichikov. And this tale teller has come by the end of the novel to justifying his taking a scoundrel as his hero. Let's see the narrator's progression. First, he's merely witty and cynical. Now this is the narrator satiric and wise. But he begins to change with looking at Korobotchka a bit too long. Page 68. And the funny turns into the sad. So if you look at it very long, what you think is funny becomes sad. He sees the jumbled up condition of Russia in the junk surrounding the icon on page 71. He too, the narrator too, meditates on the power of the feminine in the sparkling joy passage. And by the time he comes to Plushkin's manor, Plushkin's strange house that has become the repository for junk the narrator is ready for a major insight. Then he can meditate on his task. And he says, lucky is the author. He's aware of an apocalyptic revelation that awaits him on page 143. He ponders the meaning of existence in his conjuration of the memory of the dead serfs. Where is Fyrov now? Where are they now? His vision of Russia's power and her destiny begins on page 251. And then he talks about the road, 231. He talks about the road on page 232. That endless road that the Russian is so attracted to. He examines his notion of the hero on page 234 and defends him. Chichikov is not really callous, he says on page 256. He shows the decline of the right values in the home and the school and comes to realize that there are callings which are working themselves out in life. Now this is the mysterious passage that have nothing to do with one's private desires. The reading audience will say, we know ourselves well enough. You don't need to tell us our failings. And he tells the story of Moiky Kipovich and Kippy Moikovich. <laughs> one is the father and one is the son. The father is studious and quiet. And the son is a big bogatir, a big uh, hunk that does damage to everybody and people complain then to the father. And the father says, you know, what can I do? You know, I can't do anything. I can't correct my son. And so you begin to see this is Russia, you know, divided between its mind and its body and not willing to take any correction or give any. And the narrator turns to us and tells us that we need to acknowledge that there's a bit of Chichikov 
in all of us. And finally concludes his meditation with a genuine hymn to Russia's power, her fearful destiny, the end of which no one can predict. The narrator wants us to see Chichikov as the ordinary, not too good, not too bad, modernized Russian. The one who's been educated badly, given no virtues to live by, has caught on by the time he's a grown man that he must look out for himself. And yet, he finds in this scoundrel, the narrator does, nothing really wicked. It's the devil's territory that he's in. For this decay of the virtues in 19th century Russia can be attributed only to the prince of this world. But Chichikov keeps going. He may have some sort of calling that we cannot see or understand. Now let's look on page 264 and 265. And I can't see well enough to read it, so, um, Susie, can you read it? Page 264? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Stand up and read it, John. Now, do you see the part that begins, human passions are as numberless? us to see Chichikov as a figure of every man. He's a universal, and the forces that he encounters are not mere earthly ones. He's thrown up against principalities and powers. There are passions which are not of man's choosing, the author goes on. They come into the world with him and he has not the strength to deny them. They are guided by a higher destiny and have to them something eternally challenging, never to be stilled through life. They're destined to realize themselves, no matter whether they come as a dark image or flash by as a bright apparition bringing joy to the world. They're called forth for some good unknown to man. And perhaps the passion that impelled Chichikov himself was not derived from within him. Perhaps his chilly existence held the secret of what would later bring him to his knees and reduce him to ashes before the wisdom of the heavens. So we're told then that Chichikov, this mediocre man, is on a spiritual journey too. And that there are impulsions within him that do not come from himself. And perhaps they are at work now within him. Now, no one of the characters 
in this novel is demonic, but all have been debased and disfigured by their cap capitulation to the prince of darkness, to vanity and gain, to lust and exidia, to gluttony and envy. But there's a purpose to things. And things are in motion towards some telos, some end. Not only Holy Russia, then, is flashing by in a speeding troika, but the whole human project is moving towards some unknown destiny. To see and understand, to look ever more deeply, to contemplate, this is how we redeem and transform the tawdry fabric of our daily living. And that's what this whole novel is about. Now, it's written because we have a madly talented genius who writes, you know. He is talented, and he's good at his satire, but he sees deeper than the satire. And so he wants to make us see and understand and to look more deeply and to contemplate. And by doing so, we will redeem and transform the fabric of society. Now, Gogol reveals in his letters a terrible sense of guilt at having written Dead Souls. It's an interesting instance of the ordinary part of a genius not entirely understanding the genius part of him because he apologizes for the lyrical passages. He says he knew they were, you know, out of key, and he apologizes for them and thinks he should not have written them, you know, because they raised a stir. You know, the Russians reading those things didn't, didn't know whether he was making fun of Russia or what he was doing. You know, was he being satirical or not? So you have some of those letters in this volume that make interesting reading. But what he writes about the songs of Russia, now not in Dead Souls, but just in his own essays, reveals the deep melancholy of his vision. You can see page 414 in this book. And in this book also, I would recommend that you get read these short excerpts by Nabokov and by Shlavsky and by Bakhtin. There's an essay on the laughter of Gogol in here. Now Gogol says, I had a premonition <laughs> that all the lyrical digressions in the poem would be taken in a false sense. They're so vague, they're so little in accord with the objects passing before the eyes of the reader so irrelevant in the form and manner of the work as a whole that they lead both adversaries and defenders astray. And so he goes on to say he shouldn't have written them. He speaks of the narrator's sensibility, of his reaction to the sad songs of Russia, which was taken up as boasting. He speaks of these songs which rush across all of boundless Russia. And he says, these songs eat into my heart, and I marvel that everyone's not aware of the same thing. Almost 150 years have elapsed since our sovereign Peter I cleared our eyes by the purgatory of European enlightenment. He put in our hands all the means and instruments of action, and our spaces remain just as empty sorrowful and unpeopled, just as homeless and unfriendly as though we still have no home, no roof, but somewhere pause on a public road and breathe from Russia, not the hearty natal air which welcomes brothers, but a kind of cold chill at a post where only a guard, indifferent to everything, is stately, responding, no horses. So 
Gogol died feeling that he had, in a sense, written a bad work. And anything he wrote as a sequel to it, he burned, as I say. And yet it was not long after his death that the work began having its effect and it has changed our concept of what the novel can do. It has changed our concept of the extent to which the novel can reach. So, as I say, you will not find any echoes of Gogol in Turgenev. Turgenev was writing just a little bit after Gogol, but he modeled on Flaubert and the French novelists. Turgenev lived abroad most of the time and was deeply resented in Russia uh, for that fact. But then when we come to Dostoevsky, he picks up where Gogol left off and goes on with that mode which is grotesque and strange and carnivalistic. And uh, I want to talk with you about the great Russian critic Bakhtin, B-A-K-H-T-I-N, uh, that has changed our view of how to read Dostoevsky. So next time, you won't have any trouble, I think, reading Turgenev and as answering any questions about it. <laughs> so I wonder if, now before we go this evening, if you have any questions that you want to ask any of you. Look back at some of the passages of Gogol, because on a first reading, you're likely just to think of it as satire. And it is so much more than satire. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the road. That, that's the only glimpse I had that you meant that Chichikov was good because he's on the road mm -hmm. and Gogol was on the road for mm -hmm. six years traveling. And those who aren't on the road are just, they're, they're stuck. They're, they're mm -hmm. not moving anymore. That's right. They're not spiritually now, moving there's two ways that we could look at Chichikov's situation, though, that he's on his way to another town to work the same scam. Same scam. You see? <laughs> uh -huh. So we don't know, really, uh, about Chichikov for sure. But he, and we do know that sometimes when he meditates about things that it doesn't get anywhere. You know, it's just kind of a, yeah. So we don't know whether Chichikov is going to change or not. But the narrator has changed because the narrator was cynical at the beginning of this, and by the end, he's extolling uh, holy Russia, which means the right order of things in this novel. Well, do you, anybody else have, mm-hmm? Uh, John, could you perhaps pick a scene, and uh, your favorite scene, or whatever that, that illustrates, I guess, the fact that they were tested. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Would someone tell me what he said? But you said it's a grotesque novel. Uh, that's how you characterize it. Could you pick maybe a scene and explain it how how that comes out? Mm -hmm. What do you say? Oh yes. The um I couldn't see well enough to read the text with you this evening and I'm so sorry because they're wonderful passages. But the best one for that is that um, the garden of Plushkin. It's a magnificent description of the grotesque. Most of our um, instances of the grotesque are brief, like somebody that looks like a samovar, so that it looks as though two samovars are over there together. You see, but then there are times when he really goes through uh, a long, grotesque passage. And the grotesque combines in that Plushkin's garden, it combines the beautiful and the sublime with the ugly and the um, debased. And then, of course, we have that pile of rubbish at Plushkin's, uh, which is the which is grotesque in a, with an emphasis on the debased part of it. <laughs>
but almost everything is a little bit ajar. You go in a tavern and everything is usual, he says, and then he names something very unusual that's there. You see. So he uses cliches and yet he undercuts those cliches constantly. So it's a style that has, that I think is being taken up now by so many of our novelists today, the Latin American novelists who write magical realism. Uh, are using Gogo a great deal. Mm -hmm. I kind of have the image of surrealism. I see Dolly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dolly, that's right. It's just, mm -hmm. but on the other side, I feel like I can relate to a lot of these characters. He asks an absurd question, and you're so thrown off. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you see, on one side, it's such a realistic portrait that when it was first published in England, the title they gave it was Home Life in Old Russia. <laughs> so, so they thought it was a realistic description, you see, of, of life in Russia, those Russians. <laughs> Well, it's a symbol of that Russian hospitality, okay. you know, that that you're supposed to have a hot samovar going all the time, you know, to give people tea. But uh, I think it, mm -hmm. maybe that could be, like I said, looking at the food, mm -hmm. if you could look at the, in each of their homes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the food in each home is so representative. And there's one image that's so wonderful uh, when they have this party and are celebrating the uh, deed signing for the serfs, they've laid out all this great buffet of food, and Sobakovich eats the whole sturgeon, <laughs> and, and it's about this long, you see, and it's, it's meant for everybody to take a bite of it, you know, and he just keeps on until he eats the whole thing, and then goes over in the corner and tries to look innocent, <laughs> and they've just got a skeleton of a fish there. <laughs> So we're just, you, and there's hardly any food served at Nozdrivs, but there's lots of different kinds of liquor. Just name the liquor that is there at Nozdrivs. You see, because he's a gambler and a drunkard and a better, and, and he's a, a violent person uh, underneath all of that hail fellow, well met business that he gives us. Any other questions? Uh huh. Yes, I think he was familiar with Dickens, and uh, Dostoevsky was very much influenced by Dickens, but he was also influenced by the fine comedy and all, all kinds of other things. Uh, what is different about them is Dickens doesn't have, he's got a satire, but he doesn't have this weird quality that is peculiar to both Gogol and Dostoevsky. And I think the weirdness comes in from, as I say, the supernatural. I don't believe we have the supernatural in Dickens, you see. We've got the moral and the ethical, but we don't have the supernatural. So if you think about it, your great literature of the past had all these dimensions, you know, it had the, the upper world and the underworld, and that's still in our imaginations, that's still in our minds, even though we live in a society that's growing increasingly secular. Uh, but the novel was born in an age of fact. And so it had to be able, to, the novelist felt, to prove whatever they were saying. They'd have to say, this was a message I found in a bottle, you know, or something like that. <laughs> or a diary of somebody was left, you know, if they get anything strange in. Otherwise, they have to give you facts, you know, that are empirically uh, evident. So what's really different from about Dickens and Dostoevsky 
is the weirdness that comes about from the supernatural, the demonic is present, as well as the grace, you know, from the celestial world. And it throws everything off balance. Those of you that have read Flannery O'Connor, remember her story, The Misfit? And the, and the Misfit, just before he kills the old woman, he's killed the whole family, you remember? Uh, says Jesus shouldn't have, you know, shouldn't have come and shouldn't have said what he did because he thrown, thrown everything off balance, you see? And so Christianity throws everything off balance. Any genuine religion does because it's not naturalistic. So that's what we run into uh, in the Russian novel. So I'll see you then next time and you finished your game.